I, uh, I just wanted to go back for a second uh, to Dr. DeChico, uh, looking at your bio, research professor at the University of Michigan Energy Institute, bachelor's degree in mathematics from Catholic University, master's degree in mechanical engineering from North Carolina State University, PhD in mechanical engineering from Princeton University. Um, you've been involved in, in research on uh, energy and environment issues for a long time. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, you worked for the Environmental Defense Fund, is that correct? That's right, for nine years. Um, w would you be uh, characterized as a conservative witness <laughs> in general? Would you characterize yourself as that or somebody that's a, a hack for the oil industry or, or anything like that? Uh, I certainly would not. Uh, Re know. Reading your bio and looking at your background, I think that is, that is uh, fairly safe to assume. Uh, in fact, when I read your bio, I was uh, a, a little bit interested in why Republicans were bringing you to testify. Um, but hearing your testimony, being somebody who's very concerned about uh, the environment, somebody who's very concerned about carbon emissions, your testimony today, I heard you say 70% higher carbon emissions in some circumstances because of the renewable fuel standard. Is that correct? That's correct, Mr. How, Chairman. How do you get to 70% higher uh, with the renewable fuel standard. Can you share with us how that happens? Sure. Um, the thing to keep in mind is that all of the claims for reduction on, on biofuels depend on this carbon neutrality assumption. When that's not met, you start with essentially a wash when you're comparing, say, ethanol to gasoline or biodiesel to petroleum diesel. And then you have to look at the process emissions uh, from that basis. And it's not nearly as efficient to process corn ethanol from biomass as it is to process gasoline from petroleum. In fact, from a carbon efficiency point of view, basic chemistry tells us that when you ferment the fuel, and this goes for any fermented-based ethanol, whether it comes from a cellulosic feedstock or or starch like corn or sugarcane, uh, for every molecule of ethanol that you produce, one molecule of CO2 gets produced as beer bubbles. You know, when you ferment, you have a frothy thing, creates uh, CO2. So if, if you can no longer assume that that's free, free CO2, free carbon in that fuel, which is false by, by my analysis of cropland data, then right there, uh, you, you lose a lot of carbon back to the atmosphere during processing. So when you add that back in, when you add in uh, the emissions to make fertilizer, when you add in the emissions to uh, run the biorefineries, even from natural gas in a dry mill, which is a pretty efficient form of biorefinery, uh, and take away this automatic credit that the life cycle models assume, uh, you could end up with 70% higher emissions. And that's not the end of the story. I mean, that's not the upper limit on the damage when you begin to look at the ripple effects. So uh, in your testimony, I have heard uh, you mentioned harmful to the environment. I just heard you use, use the word damage to the environment, higher CO2 emissions, um, uh, in some cases 70% higher. You mentioned water pollution. You mentioned algae bloom. Uh, you, did you mention, I think yesterday when I talked to you, you mentioned deforestation. Can you talk to that for a second? Uh, sure. Um, when you divert crops from the food and feed market, um, and, and what's going on in the country now, around 40% of our corn harvest is going into ethanol production. Now, some of that comes back as co-product, but it nets out to about uh, 30%. Well, does that mean people are eating 30% uh, less food or that we're having 30% less cattle? Uh, no. Uh, we have a global commodity market, and what happens is that when uh, grains uh, are diverted into the fuel market, that uh, grain that would otherwise be used for food has to get made up somewhere else. And if you trace that, as a number of scientific analyses have done uh, in the past several years, and look at the ripple effect, uh, the loss of grain from American fields due to the biofuel mandate 
results, for example, in additional deforestation in Brazil and Sub-Saharan Africa as the food markets try to compensate and have to put more land into production. Uh, this is a highly uncertain effect, but there's no doubt because of the coupling of global commodity markets that this effect, which is known as indirect land use change, is occurring. Thank you, Dr. DeChico. Uh, I'm, I'm out of time, uh, but it, it is uh, important to note that if it's damaging to the environment, if it's putting more CO2 emissions into the atmosphere, if, the, if, if it's adding to prices uh, for both food and fuel, uh, it leaves us wondering what are, what are the reasons that we still have the renewable fuel standard. Um, I'd like to recognize the ranking member.